Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the uh, OWASP Day. This is uh, Tony UV, I'm the OWASP Atlanta chapter leader. I'm gonna be covering an introductory uh, walkthrough through PASTA, which is a risk-centric threat modeling uh, methodology that was invented by myself and a co-colleague of mine named Marco Morana, also affiliated with OWASP. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to uh, select my screen here. All right, so hopefully you guys are, are seeing that. This is a talk called Cooking with Pasta, Risk-Centric Offensive-Minded Threat Modeling Methodology Intro. And it really, this is intended for those individuals that are um, going to be, you know, just wanting an intro into threat modeling and, uh, you know, maybe haven't been exposed into a risk-centric approach. So, my focus here today is to really kind of walk you through the process for attack simulation and threat analysis. And uh, I only have an hour to do that, but uh, hopefully we'll cover all of the stages today. All right, so first off about me. So in 2015, me and Marco, we basically wrote this book, Risk-Centric Threat Modeling with Wiley, Wiley uh, Publishing, because of multiple years of being frustrated on being able to convey application security flaws to uh, product owners, uh, developers, um, upwards in the organization that we work at. And so we basically, you know, use a lot of our respective experiences in order to come up with this book. I personally have 25 years of ITIS experience. I used to be an engineer, a developer, uh, a network engineer, also a CISO, a risk management professional. And today I run uh, the security firm Versprite out of Atlanta. Uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter for any sort of additional insight that you want in terms of threat modeling and or security. I'm always chatting about security related items as well as LinkedIn. Okay, so today's agenda, we're going to be focusing on number one, the overview of the methodology and then going through each of the stages. It's my intention to try to reach a broad audience of developers, of architects, of security champions, of those that are just simply curious about threat modeling and want to understand about this risk-centric approach and then go through each of the stages so that you can take something back to hopefully get started in applying PASTA, which is the process for attack simulation and threat analysis in your respective security programs. So one of the things that is center to PASTA is it's a risk-centric approach. Now, what does this mean? Well, in security, when you're hacking in an application, whether it be a mobile application or an actual IoT-based device, you're really trying to convey to a product owner why they should fix some of the flaws that you've identified. And traditionally, you know, companies or application owners are ignorant in terms of what could be, go wrong. Um, they don't know if there is something wrong already with their application. Um, they might be having a over-reliance on vendors in order to, um, you know, determine if the tools are actually finding the flaws and re just relying on that. And at the end of the day, you know, there's you know, there's some individuals that might be in sheer panic mode and just simply want to fix what has been found. And so the process for attack simulation and threat analysis was really meant to be a true methodology, step by step, where we can uh, inject these uh, context, uh, different types of context that we'll go over. Now, one of the things that, uh, you know, so it has seven stages, PASTA does. Um, stage one, we'll cover this in detail, but it has seven stages. And these stages were meant to be building blocks of one another. So stage two will build off of the, you know, efforts of stage one, et cetera. And that makes this to be a linear process that allows you to build on top of each prior stage and leverage existing activities that might be present within your particular organization in terms of security testing, whether it be code review, whether it be third-party li library analysis, or whether it be static analysis, even threat monitoring for different types of application infrastructure, but we'll get into that. So the first step is really, let's define the objectives. Oftentimes when you do threat modeling, you don't really understand what does this application do? What does this application do not just 
uh, for the user base, but for the business that is trying to maybe monetize this application. Or maybe this application doesn't even have a monetization model. It actually is something that's more backend for backend processing for a company. As a security champion or a developer, you really have to understand what is it that's important that I've been asked to do to develop uh, for this application or to protect it if you're a security champion or security leader. Same thing, you know, we talked about, I talked about context was gonna be really big in pasta. So, you know, there's the context of what is important. There's also the context of what is my attack surface? Uh, is my attack surface, you know, some third party frameworks that I might be leveraging that I might be overly confident in that I might not be, you know, um, considering some vulnerabilities or attack vectors that might be affecting the, my framework. So oftentimes you can't protect what you don't know. And so it's really important to define that attack surface and understand what that technology scope is. So from a context of like, what am I working with? That's what stage two is about. Stage three is how does this all come together? How do the components of the different language bases that I have compile libraries, third party, lib uh, third party libraries, even, um, you know, cloud related services or SaaS related service providers that are maybe managing your identity or brokering your identity store. Uh, you wanna be able to understand what that scope is in stage two, and you wanna be able to see how it all works together in stage three. Stage four, five, and six really is more of the security centric activities that goes into what could go wrong. Stage four is understanding what does my application do and um, what sort of threats are out there that want to A, steal credit card, B, achieve persistence, C, do extortion, um, D, maybe just simply uh, do some defacement or um, you know, some level of goal settings for hacktivism. You want to be able to have greater context for what you are defending based upon the climate of threats that are affecting your defined attack surface, right? Um, in stage two and your technology footprint. Sometimes your technology footprint will actually inherently bring in certain types of threats. Also your data model consumption might also lend to what types of threats that you should be considering. Five and six are definitely a lot more traditional, but the great thing about PASA is that it creates this wrapper or envelope around traditional activities like vulnerability assessments, like vulnerability analysis and penetration testing, uh, exploit testing, uh, even some degrees of reverse engineering, if there's some time to factor it in. But uh, you know, the, the key identity, identity here is what is vulnerable? And then stage six is what is likely to be exploited and in terms of viable attack patterns. And in terms of stage seven, it's simply looking at you know, what all of this uh, previous stages resulted in. You know, what, what, was, what actually worked in terms of an exploit against my attack surface that I defined in stage two? Now that I've actually successfully exploited something, how big of an impact is it to what I defined as an objective in stage one? Um, what sort of vulnerabilities were actually leveraged in order to realize some of the threat objectives in stage four? So as you can see, it all PASTA really builds on top of the prior steps in, in the methodology. All right, so moving on forward, we're gonna go into um, just some other key attributes. It's, it's again, risk-centric, contextual. It's aimed at being more attack-minded, uh, thinking like a criminal. Oftentimes when we do threat modeling, we're thinking more defensively, right? What is, you know, this caller talking to this other, uh, you know, endpoint, you know, as, and we start doing our data flow diagrams. And then oftentimes threat modeling might just end with that. And that is not threat modeling because where is the threat in that? So it's building context of threats. It's building um, more offensive minded psyche about how do I attack this application and for what reason, right? If you have more of a criminal mindset, you can basically say, I want to dot, dot, dot. I want to extract P personal information. I want to extort. I want to deface. I want to, you know, do some level of, you know, hacktivism. I want to do some malicious file upload for whatever reason. I want to achieve persistence. I want to do crypto jacking. So you, you, you want to be able to think what are the goals that might be inherent to your industry, to the technology stack that you're using. Um, 
the process itself, the value is, you know, you, 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 you have a collaborative approach to doing threat modeling for once. Um, threat modeling in most activities is usually a security champion and maybe a couple of developers and an architect, and that's it. But Pasta really in incorporates other, you know, people to the table to have the discussion. What about the infrastructure engineers that are actually provisioning your environment in the cloud? Or maybe on-prem, what about the network engineers that are actually governing, you know, ingress, egress access for your application? So obviously we all know about the cliche of security in depth. And if you don't, if you forego some of the other components in your attack surface that support your application, you're really not looking at the entire uh, entirety of what could go wrong from a threat perspective. Okay, so now let's look at some of these supporting activities to Pasta. Again, this is a process, you know, one-on-one -on -one introduction to the process for attack simulation and threat analysis. And as you see this kind of like beehive looking um, you know, uh, imagery here, what I'm trying to depict here is a lot of different activities that might already exist in an organization. And so if you're in a corporate environment and you're, you know, a Fortune 500 or a mid cap 1000 or even a startup, you might have certain, you know, uh, cells of these of this beehive representation here that are, are being supported by some of your engineering team, some of your developers, maybe outside third parties. And so Pasta serves as a wrapper to say which of these cells is actually being done and how could I basically take the output of what these uh, groups are doing and have them as inputs into the different stages of Pasta. And we're gonna actually explore that. So we begin with stage one. Right. Let's begin with really understanding what's happening in stage one. This is a risk centric approach and a risk centric approach means that you have to understand what is risk. And in simple terms, you have to understand what is important, right, for the organization. And if we frame it in the in the in the in the form of objectives, you can have multiple objectives. Um, I look at threat modeling as a list of libraries and matching them together. So look at this slide as like a library of objectives that the application supports. If you're in retail and e-commerce, maybe one of the objectives is resiliency. Maybe one of the objectives is ensuring uh, cardholder compliance. Maybe one of the objectives is data privacy, right? Depending upon where you are in the world, um, your requirements and some of the implications if you don't uh, manage privacy correctly. Maybe with some of the loyalty applications that you have on your mobile device or on your web application. There's multiple different objectives that are internally driven, externally driven, um, that are driven sometimes by a company's customers. And so there's an opportunity to basically now incorporate governance. And you know, from a more of a technical realm that is threat modeling, governance really doesn't make its way into those discussions. But with PASTA, it actually has an opportunity to bake it in from the very beginning. Because if you see and understand that you have, for example, some regulatory or privacy related requirements to let's say retention or encryption for data at rest or data in transit, then you can pull in any sort of governance requirements from the very beginning in order to ensure that business objective of ensuring that you have cryptographic controls for data at rest that is sensitive in nature, as an example. So again, this really begins with understanding not the security objectives, but first, what are the business objectives? And yes, the business doesn't want to get fined. The business doesn't want an application that is not resilient. The business doesn't want an application that's going to cough up, you know, credentials or personal information for liability and reputational reasons. Right. So understand the business objectives. And then, you know, from there, you know, you can basically have running in the background. What is risky? Right. And so here's some examples. So reduce financial risk associated with, let's say, malware banking attacks. And a couple of years ago, um, malware specific to banks was at an all time high. And, you know, the, the manner in which those were introduced into, let's say, an application environment could have been through, for example, malicious file uploads. So if you see a rising threat and you know that this malware is looking to steal information and that is a business liability, you want to make sure that your use cases for uh, file upload are properly mitigated, you know, in terms of uh, controls. 
Um, another example, just to kind of keep moving on, is related to ensuring confidentia confidentiality of client data. Let's say you're a law firm and let's say you're a development company that develops legal software. Obviously, confidentiality, client attorney privilege is at the backbone of that industry and should be at the backbone of any platform that is digitizing legal documents, especially that are sensitive in nature. So cryptographic means to store the data, to transmit the data, to secure the data, governing access control models inherently should be some technical objectives that support the business objectives. Okay, so that was just a light touch on stage one. There's a lot more to each stage, but because of the shortness of time, I really wanna just make sure I comprehensively cover the full methodology that is PASTA. We're gonna hit stage two, which is really trying to understand your attack surface. You have to know what you are protecting. And many, in many instances, you know, we as professionals in application security, uh, product security, we don't properly scope, we underscope. We focus just on the application domain and we assume that other threat modeling conversations are actually being happening at the infrastructure level in the cloud or maybe at the device level. So you really have to understand, it's okay that you might have a smaller uh, threat modeling exercise for just your part of the application. Let's say you're just focusing on the mobile application. You can do a threat model just on your mobile application and the mobile API endpoint. But you do want to understand that you might have dependencies that might relate to extraneous APIs, other web applications, obviously the underlying network infrastructure, you know, virtual systems, even DNS, right? Even DNS. All of these things, if we take it back to stage one, could be the undermining vulnerability flaw, misconfiguration, whatever you want to call it, that could actually undermine the application, the reputation of the application, and quite honestly, your reputation as a security professional charged with doing some level of um, security championing via threat, mo threat modeling. All right, so again, I've said it a couple of times now, you can't protect what you don't know exists. You can't just simply have and oh well, I didn't know that was there. And so there is a couple of different you know, things to consider when, you know, when defining an attack surface. Our goal in this stage is to, what am I running with, whether it be things that I've created as a developer, things that I maintain as an engineer, things that I may maintain in the infrastructure, but as well as what sort of dependencies I might have with third-party services. You know, how does my Kubernetes, if I'm using Kubernetes for orchestration, for my environments, running different you know, services that have been Dockerized, I need to understand what the configuration is. I can't just simply focus on my API calls, my application calls, and, and yes, I might have defined the trust models around that. I may have enumerated all the protocols, you know, uh, and the data flows. But if my if I do have an infrastructure flaw, you know, in terms of my configuration that my application resides on, then I, I'm not calling my application to be thoroughly vetted from a threat model perspective. So we have to be very comprehensive and understand, um, you know, what the attack surface is. And this also includes maybe some services that are internal, external, that are responsible for, you know, identity management, federation, you know, whatever the case may be, even operating system settings, if you're going to, towards more of a traditional on-prem environment, physical, the physical system OS that might be housing an application, uh, all those considerations need to be considered. And of course, last but not least, you're actually, your actual application and software. All right. So, with technology enumeration, you might be asking, well, Tony, you're chefing up some pasta over here in the kitchen. What are some you know, ways that we can enumerate and find out what we're running? And so here's some quick examples. Number one, you know, if you're dealing with like web-enabled, um, web-related web, web app portal applications, if there's a dashboard, if there's some sort of like, you know, human interface, you can basically try to run something like built with API. It really does a good job of trying to see what you're running you know, at a very high level, but things that might be that you may not have known in terms of like JavaScript frameworks, widgets, um, any sort of third party integration. So very useful there from a uh, overall application environment standpoint, you know, two great tools is a traditional one and a new one. Nmap, classic fingerprinting, OS detection, service protocol enumeration, all those things serve as attack vectors, right? 
for an application. Um, and then Rumble is another great one that runs extremely fast for, you can run it for an application environment, both in the cloud and on-prem. And it does a great job of finding out what you're running quickly. Spidering has a great use case um, in terms of finding out what web pages that might, you might be having on your site that you may not have known that actually has code. Maybe it has some iframes in there with some embedded you know, code that's legacy from another site, right? You want to be able to know, again, what is your technology footprint? There's a, a lot of other lists of things there. I don't want to uh, belabor the, the topic because I'm already 20 minutes into the presentation here, but everything from proxying, using proxies, PCAP captures, uh, requirements documents that came in from business analysts or project managers that specified these are the internal things that we need to run. Reverse engineering tools uh, also, process memory mapping tools if you're dealing with more like of um, you know SCADA type of environments and you want or like more uh, hardware based you know environments then you, you maybe you can run some process mappers like VMAP, VM map. Uh, and then last but not least a tabletop discussion. There's nothing beats simply getting together with the engineering team, the cloud team, developers, architects, and just kind of hashing out and say, hey, what are you working with? What are you supporting for this environment? And then that'll be helpful to align what is the technology um, landscape. Step three is application decomposition. So we, we built the context of like, what is important for the application? We built the context of like, what are we running? Now we are building the context of like, how does it all talk to one another? And this phase, one of the key outputs is trying to understand, do I have implicit trust models, which is always a problem. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, an IoT device talking to the cloud, or if you're basically an embedded device that is talking to maybe a, uh, uh, you know, the, um, like an, an automobile component you might have an implicit trust model that might be a good conduit for exploitation. So knowing how all the components, again, the components from stage two are actually talking to one another is really important. This particular data flow diagramming is uh, produced by Threat Dragon, a NOWAS project. So you may wanna check out Threat Dragon uh, to see how you can produce data flow diagrams. Stage three of PASTA is where you would produce your data flow diagrams, work with architecture, um, understand what are the calls and the integrations of all those things that you discovered in stage two and see how they interrelate in stage three. Okay, so quick retail example, and we're gonna go into some DFD etiquette really quick. So point of sale system. We've all used different point of sale systems, maybe from a consumer standpoint, but let's say you're in the business of developing point of sale software. Um, you know, if we're going to basically do some data flow diagramming, and here's a quick retail example, you want to be able to, you know, label your different flows with action verbs. You want to be able to kind of show like what sort of actions are happening between processes, between API endpoints, between, you know, trust boundaries or trust zones within an application. Um, traditionally, some of the symbols that have been used over time, some of these aren't used anymore. There's different software. There's a software uh, it's called Threat Modeler. It's a commercial software. It actually uses different types of like uh, uh, symbols and representations, much like you would see in like, for example, Concept Draw, if you're familiar with that, or uh, Visio. And, um, and and they have other types of like iconic figures to kind of represent, you know, data sources or callers or different actors that are in your data flow diagram. But if you're going to go old school, um, you know, the traditional things like, for example, the parallel bars, typically has resembled a, a data source, maybe a data store, a file system, non-relational database. Obviously you have your actors. Um, typically you have some sort of like asset component that's represented with a uh, rectangle. And then you obviously you have your requests and your responses. Oftentimes, uh, you know, when I see a DFD, I see the requests, I don't see the response. I don't see the response going back. I, you know, it, it's helpful to know you know, to be depicted in a DFD that there is a response and if there's anything that is changing. Now, one thing that we do know with data flow diagramming that is changing is the information that's coming back. And that information that is coming back may actually be information that might be, you know, um, used by an attacker. Uh, another thing too is sometimes the response, especially over web, if you have um, non-stringent HTTP require, uh, TLS requirements, 
uh, where you're not strictly defining that HTTPS should be used, your response back to get an image or something else, or maybe a script might be coming back over an unencrypted medium. So it's important to not just understand the request, but also the response is coming back. So some quick uh, do's and don'ts, uh, I'm sorry, some quick guidelines and also some tool recommendations. But, you know, basically overall, when you have, you know, you, obviously you have in an application, you have things that run as a process, things that are, might be event driven, things that might be scheduled. Um, and but there's generally a process or a binary that gets triggered to basically make a call. And so typically you can have those types of entities within a data flow diagram talking to one another. Um, but typically you don't have like two data stores talking to one another, uh, you know, automagically. Uh, you definitely have typically like a broker or a process doing some level of interaction between two SATA data stores. So it's just something to consider when you're doing your own homegrown DFDs as part of threat modeling. And please again, remember that the DFD alone is not threat modeling because a data flow diagram shows the flow of data between callers across trust boundaries, but it has no depiction of threats. There is no model of threats. So it doesn't really do anything to illustrate to a developer, to an engineer, what should I be worried about, which is really what they're after. All right, let's go into stage four. Speaking of threats, very good segue is really trying to understand the threat context. Earlier on, I said that PASTA is really about bringing the context into threat modeling and threat context has sorely been missing. So it's trying to look at, we don't want to fear monger our audiences, whether they're developers or whether they're you know product owners, we wanna have credible evidence-based threats to build on. So first off, this is a, you know, Pasta is a uh, play on actual food, right, with, with the Italian pasta. It is an acronym for the process for attack simulation and threat analysis. So you can't have pasta with some weak sauce. You have to have some really good evidence-based sauce in terms of threat analytics. Stride is a mnemonic that has been used and recommended by many of my peers in threat modeling, and it's, it's continuously recommended, and I don't know why. Um, and well, I do know why the, the rhetoric is, is that it's simple. It's simple to implement. It's six buckets of spoofing, tampering, you know, uh, elevation of privilege, denial of service, information disclosure, repudiation, and it's static. So stride five years ago, stride five years from now, it doesn't make sense to have static threats, threats, especially even across industries. What it ha what's affecting FinTech is not gonna be affecting the utility sector, what's affect, affecting e-commerce may not be uh, affecting manufacturing, right? So you have some inherent threads that are industry focused um, and it, it doesn't make sense to have a static threat list for all industries that is static even over time. So it doesn't make any sort of like rational sense. And that's for, for really for you, for all of you that are listening to really understand that build your own threat library build your own threat library. And there's multiple different ways that you can do that. And we're going to get into that um, very shortly. So first off, there's two, two good ways. One is to listen to what everyone else is saying in terms of Intel, right? You want to be able to, if you're a threat modeler, if you're the, the, the role of who to be doing this would be the security champion, understand what is inherent to your industry, understand the threat Intel that is maybe providing an insight into attack behavior right now against your industry, a your technology footprint based upon your technology selection defined in stage two. Uh, what about your data type, your data model, your data consumption model, right? Uh, what sort of threats are more pervasive based upon how you're consuming data? All of these things you can get from different trends, advisories, if you do enough in proper subscription to the right channels. And I understand there's a lot of noise there, but even if you are able to build a threat library that consists of, you know, four or five, but that are specific to your application within your industry for your data model, for your deployment model, that's still going to be way better than a static list mnemonic like Stripe. So the other aspect, so beyond listening to, you know, what advisories might be out there is what your application infrastructure is telling your security operations center right, or is telling your, you know, security incident event monitoring platforms. 
your application environment is an ecosystem and there's things that are being requested legitimately and that are being requested illegitimately and your logs are capturing a lot of this information it's the you know, the capability of different types of solutions to be able to harvest this information and 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 for the security analysts in those functions to be able to say hey you know for your applications these are some of the types of behaviors abusive behaviors that we're seeing we're seeing some session hijacking attempts we're seeing some brute force uh, uh, you know, uh brute force attacks we're seeing some denial of service attacks right you know we're seeing some uh, malicious follow uploads um so that these sort of things are logged in the applications uh, logs, and they're also logged at different system logs and network logs. And that combined with threat intel can provide for more context in terms of uh, what to factor into your threat model. So quick do's and don'ts, build your own threat intel sources, uh, know where your threat intel sources are coming from, maybe subscribe to some different ISACs that are out there, FS ISAC, ITS ISAC, there's a retail ISAC, there's a utility sector ISAC, um, and, and see how the threat intel, intel jives with your technology footprint defined in stage two, and how it's all flowing together as defined by the application decomposition stage in stage three. Um, don't use one sort of source of data. Um, don't use your competitor's threat analysis. Your competitor's threat model may not be your threat model for an array of reasons, an array of reasons that relates to, you know, reputation. Maybe it relates to geopolitical associations, the things that might lend to hacktivism. There is a whole different level of attributes that a competitive product for another competitor within the same industry doesn't really lend to you having the same exact threat model. So make sure that you build your own, just like some homemade pasta, don't just get the uh, store shelf stuff. All right, um, just for some more kind of visualization and, and trying to rethink, you know, how to leverage threat intel is, you know, in a threat model, you, you, you wanna be able to understand what are my targeted attacks that are targeting me, my application, my company for whatever reason, what are opportunistic attacks, right? And there's always every company is going to have, you know, opportunistic attacks or maybe industry related threats. So you need to factor these things and map them to your attack surface. I already mentioned this a little bit. Um, it's, it's kind of belaboring the point, but I wanted to just reemphasize you have an opportunity to align your threat consumption with your attack surface in stage two, your industry that supports your application. And then context of like, what are the impacts of these threats that you, as you define a threat library, what is the impact to my application from what I've defined in stage one? Um, and then we're going to get to the, you know, what are these threats and how would they be materialized from a vulnerability exploit perspective? So final thing on Stride is um, dump it, right? Dump Stride, build your own threat library, use something like Sticks and you know, if we take a look at, you know, just sticks here, and this is kind of just a little little sliver, a little, little uh, prosciutto, if you will, slice to, to basically get a glimpse of the, the, the richness that is available in the sticks framers to really create your own threat library, supersede stride, and have something that's tailored to your application based upon, you know, threat actors that are evidence supported, threat objectives that maybe you weren't considering, and so these are things that are really important to, to, to factor in so that you can build your own threat library. Okay, vulnerability analysis and weak, uh, weakness analysis is really where we uh, start to map, you know, what weaknesses will give way to realizing threats. Before we dive in, oftentimes in security, you hear attacks and threats used as in the same terminology. So oftentimes in conversation, I would say, you know, what threat library have you built? And they, and I get responses that says, well, I'm using the ATT ampersand attack framework, you know, from MITRE, which is a great framework, but it's, again, no one's doing their homework. Everyone wants to be able to say, let me just get this off the shelf and run with it. This is my, this is my threat library, but those are attack patterns, just like KPEC. And then you can build great attack libraries with those things, but you really want to be able to map your threats, to what are the vulnerabilities that are gonna to lead to those threats and what are the attacks that are gonna make those viable. So the activities in PASTA specifically is to, you know, begin to think about what are the vulnerabilities 
that I know about my application that support the threat goals. If my threat goal is to steal intellectual property, uh, maybe I, you know, one of one of my, you know, things is to really trying to uh, part of that intellectual property might be you know stealing the client database that's associated with my SaaS product because I have a nation state that is interested in knowing what customers are actually using this product that they're trying to you know uh, replicate in their respective area. So you know having you know it, building the, the the mapping the threat objective of like steel client database with maybe correlating the vulnerabilities with the infrastructure that supports that database or database related vulnerabilities is really where we start to have now more of the intermappings between vulnerability analysis and threat analysis. So the key point here, obviously, with uh, stage five of PASA is to identify what is wrong. What is wrong with the application in terms of not just vulnerabilities that might be in my code base through static analysis, but also what is wrong with my design? What's wrong with my you know, a trust model that I may have discovered in step three? In stage three, where maybe I saw that there were, have been some implicit trust models between one actor to a uh, data source in my application call. So a lot of things factor into the vulnerability bucket. It can come from manual, uh, prior manual security testing um, and some flaws or weaknesses that were identified there. It could, um, you know, vulnerabilities or weaknesses in architecture could stem from going through that data flow diagramming through stage three. Uh, obviously using different types of vulnerability scanners at different levels in order to understand what part of my application environment is actually vulnerable that would give way to realizing some of the threats in stage four. Um, some good tool recommendations, just, you know, it's always good to make some tool recommendations. Obviously your traditional vuln scanners that are out there, um, you know, Nessus, uh, Qualys, et cetera, um, you know, uh, edge scan, no security project has a great project where it actually basically lists out um, and, and ties to the NIST National Vulnerability Database uh, to see what sort of, you know, associated vulnerabilities might be affecting your Node.js implementation. Retire.js and Sync.js. Retire.js is really cool because it looks at what sort of JavaScript libraries and functions you actually may need to deprecate uh, because they're vulnerable to different types of vulnerabilities that have been found. The OWASP a, a dependency check is, is a great project in order to find what sort of third-party dependencies that you might be using that might be vulnerable uh, based upon the, the tools dependency check, uh, checker. Black Duck, Gymnasium, SourceClear. Uh, SourceClear was a company developed by one of the founders of OWASP, Mark Kerfee, and also does a great job in trying to find flaws within your application environment. The tools list is endless. Um, it's really the mindset. This is a talk about have following a process and sewing together tools, practices, you know, in terms of vuln management, vuln assessment, static analysis, dynamic analysis, you know, baking in all those things and saying of all of the noise that I'm seeing in vulnerability analysis, which are the ones that are material to the threats in my threat library, right? The whole point with pasta is let's focus on the things that are most risky in terms of you know, impact to the business, again, based upon stage one. All right. Um, I talked a lot about this already, so we're going to move forward just for the sake of time. But really the key thing here is, is that you have an opportunity, you know, either maybe if you're a developer and you're trying to follow this process, maybe you tap on the shoulder of your individual in your organization or outside your organization and say, give me a list of validated non-false positive vulnerabilities that match that would realize these threats. So let, let's walk through this example. Let's say that you are an, a software development company and you don't have a security team and you rely on a third party to do pen testing. And so you, you basically say, guys, uh, outside group, we developed this threat library. I want you to basically find all the things that you found in your last pen test or maybe your managed service vulnerability assessment service that they do for you and say, hey, Give me all the true positives that match these threats. And so let them do the hard work, get the ROI in that relationship, have them basically then enumerate what becomes then a vulnerability library. We have a threat library. We have a vulnerability library, right? So we start to build out these libraries, and then that's what's going to basically lead to 
um, some of the trees that we're going to build in the next stage. One of the opportunities that you have with um, with pasta, and it, it, you know, there's not enough time to really talk about the interrelationships of different frameworks that are out there. But you take ASVS, the Application Security Verification Standard. You take the OWASP TEP10 if you like. Um, but you have an opportunity to look at domains that might be of concern, right? If you are managing an application or you're developing an application and it is an application where there's a lot of sensitive information in there um, and it's, it's uh, you want to ensure proper authentication and proper authorization models, then, you know, out of the gate, you may have identified that authorization and authentication were high impact areas from stage one in pasta. Now, under vulnerability management, you have an opportunity to see under ASVS in OWASP top 10, what sort of like activities, what sort of risk, what sort of like um, uh, standards in, in those respective areas need to be checked almost systematically. So you're contextualizing everything from the prior levels, the contextualizing what's important to do from stage one, contextualizing you know, what you're caring about from stage four and threat analysis, but everything builds upon the prior step. Now, you might be wondering, well, what are some good inputs and outputs uh, for this specific stage of vulnerability analysis? And you know, inputs might be, obviously, you wanna bring in your technology enumeration that you found. You found your attack surface in stage two, you wanna scan it and make sure there's nothing vulnerable there, right? So stage two is a great input for stage five because it says, this is what my attack surface is. And I wanna know what here is vulnerable not just what's vulnerable, but what's vulnerable that supports the threats defined in my threat library. That is very important because otherwise it just becomes big lists that makes threat modeling to be very, very time consuming. And that's not what risk centric threat modeling is about. It's about focusing on the things that are higher impact and threat, uh, threat um, that have a higher risk level for the application. So same thing, you know, I had, I think a mobile application example here, threat intelligence for mobile application. Um, really, you know, that's just meant to be put in here as an example for mobile applications. If you're developing mobile applications, like what are mobile malware? Big, big, big problem. And you might have use cases where, okay, well, how is mobile malware actually happening? Is it because it's trusting other types of uh, applications of a certain type that authorization is, is, is needed by the user? And so that might affect your use cases that you have in your mobile client application, as an example. So inputs are going to be threat intel, you know, obviously context of what is important business impact. Um, but outputs from this phase are going to be like, all right, let me let me basically, um, you know, produce my static analysis reports, vulnerable reports, web application dash reports, et cetera. So that, you know, now I want to be able to create a vulnerability library of things that I'm concerned about that are real, that are vetted, that support and that could make the threat objectives to be actually true. So we're going to get to the good stuff. This is the attack modeling phase. This is where we start to think more like a criminal. Now we want to prove that the things that we found to be vulnerable are actually viable. And proving that is so centered to risk-centric threat modeling because it's not a risk if it's not viable, right? Now, it puts a lot of emphasis on testing for viability, but you can blueprint a good model for attack by using attack trees. And the parent node of these attack trees are typically something that, you know, begins with like a threat objective. Like maybe you want to, as a threat actor, you want to compromise credit card information. And maybe your target asset as part of that is you want to focus on the browser or the client application that might be interacting between the user or the, or the uh, human actor and the actual inf the credit card information itself, right? So, you know, you under the underlying node is usually the, the asset or target. And then from there on down, you could have one layer of attacks. You could have two layers of attacks. This is where you pull in KPEG. This is where you pull in attack, right? This is, and, and you can rope in those types of attack patterns and say, huh, how could I realize man in the middle of uh, attack, you know, at the browser level, what type of attack pattern is or exploit do I need to look up in my you know, attack framework library or my KPEG library to see that I, that I want to test specifically for this? Ultimately, what you want to get to, this becomes a blueprint for exploitation. This becomes a blueprint for what you want to attack on your application or your application component. 
And your attack tree can be large, medium, or small, right? If you're doing iterative development and you're just building out a, you know, one component of the story in, in your software development lifecycle, you may have one target asset or use case that you want to map out what are the attack patterns or abuse cases that you want to exercise. Attack modeling stage six is where that exercising actually happens. So, you know, I talked about you, you could have, you know, this is like what I consider to be a branch. Your trees can be small, they can be, you know, they can be big. And, you know, the good thing about attack trees is that they can be focused on just one aspect or facet of a component of your application. Here we're looking at a, um, you know, attacker trying to impersonate another user. And the attack is, you know, trying to see what ways, what means, what other attack patterns would allow for this threat from uh, to take place. And so you might have things around, you know, spoofing in terms of uh, trying to spoof the authentication token. Let's say that you have a dynamic token that is created because of some homemade token tokenization service that you might be building or running. But let's say that, that it's not very good and it's predictable uh, mathematically. And so, you know, those are attack patterns that you want to say, well, how likely is it for me to mathematically guess, you know, a dynamic token that's created based upon my knowledge of uh, what the uh, algorithm appears to be as an attacker? And so they want to test that viability so that they can maybe guess a legitimate token and render it back to the application. The point here is, is that we start to map threats to attacks. And what's missing here is definitely the vulnerability. We can do threats to vulnerabilities and then what attack patterns could actually exploit that vulnerability so that we can get to the viability question that we're, that we're needing to answer. Here's another example, point of sale system. I wish I could kind of scope in here uh, a little bit. I think I'm going to try to use this guy right here. Okay. So, you know, the idea here is that, you know, again, it's all in layers and you can build different. This is another rendering of an attack tree. Here we have threat motive, threat agent, um, target entity, you know, basically your, your application component or target entity, and then the attack patterns. Here's the attack vector, the attack pattern. But, you know, these trees are very helpful because, again, they provide a blueprint for you know trying to begin with a, uh, an entry from your threat library steal credit card data um you know and then you basically kind of understand you know this crime syndicate node is meant to represent the threat intel that you found in stage four this vendor software uh development <clears throat> component or this vendor logical access looks like these are vendor dependencies within the application model that serves as you know a target asset um, <clears throat> the illicit software repo access is meant to do a supply chain attack right here. So this is the attack vector. This one right here, if we have a vendor and I'm a, and, and I'm a criminal that's trying to basically, you know, uh, being supported by a crime syndicate, maybe your application is pretty resilient from the front door, but I maybe do enough fingerprinting of your application in order to sniff out that you're using a vendor as part of your overall application environment. So maybe I want to taint the software repo of that vendor so that I can backdoor into your application. So these, this, this sort of like attack conceptualizing is very, very helpful, very, very important. You're not going to get there with Stride. You're going to get there by building your own threat library, mapping the vulnerabilities that realize those threats, and then mapping the attack patterns that says, is this vulnerability viable? Let me just dip out of here. See. All right, next slide. All right, so here's yet another example. I wanted to provide a lot of examples on the attack tree stuff, you know, and, and, and the main thing here is, is that a blueprint for attack. You know, pasta is the process for attack simulation and threat analysis. Think like a criminal. How do we get there? What, what, what let's not waste time as white hats and run like, no, no shade on Metasploit, but just simply run a Nessa scan and run Metasploit and say, hey, I'm a hacker. No, that's not, how, that's not, that's definitely not how a real criminal is going to operate. They're going to say, first, what do I want, right? Do I want credit card data? Do I want <clears throat> to do malvertising, right? To basically introduce, uh, uh, you know, malicious ads through your platform if it consumes ads. They want to, they're going to think that way. So, 
<clears throat> the attack tree provides a blueprint. So maybe you are focused on as a target, the uh, browser or the client side. So test the uh, possibility for browser or client side attacks. Um, maybe you want to look at, you know, SQL injection as a viable attack pattern that is really aimed at the target of the web application. Uh, so then great, then maybe come up with a good attack library of numeric SQL injection or logical based SQL injection in order to basically see the viability. You guys get the example, the attack trees, whether you do it internally in your organization or externally, you have the opportunity to build out um, <clears throat> a blueprint for attack. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, we got 10 minutes left. We're in the final stretch, stage seven, residual risk analysis. At the end of the day, it's about reducing risk. Application teams are being paid by somebody up top. There's a rationale for that application. There's a reason for that application. There's valuable information around that application, context of what's important. Let's focus on building countermeasures that mitigate the threats that are important. <coughs> so in this stage, we want to reintroduce um, some of the prior stages of stage one, what's important, why do I care, what are the objectives of the application? Stage two, what are the components that I'm working with that you know are the focus of my countermeasures that I need to apply? Stage three, how, did, how do they all work together? Stage four, what is my threat intel telling me? You know, this factors into the threat variable in my um, threat, in my risk formula. <clears throat> Excuse me. So residual risk formulas, and risk formulas are as a dime a dozen. Residual risk, let's just jump to the good stuff right here. Um, this fourth bullet point here, residual risk should be a reflection of the probability of threat occurrence, right? And that's usually in stage six. Like I have a threat defined in stage four and in stage six, I test the viability of attacks that support that threat. It's not just testing any attacks. It's testing attacks that realize those threats. So it's all contextual. Same thing for um, probability of vulnerability. What is the probability that vulnerability might get discovered? Not all vulnerabilities are equal. I mean, there might be some, you know, an embedded component within a highly protected, you know, hardware device that is deployed, the, oper the deployment model is internal only into a back office of, uh, you know, uh, of an environment, uh, a customer that adopted that, bought that product. The probability of the vulnerability and discovery is something that also needs to be considered, right? And so when you look at probability, that's going to say, well, do I care about the vulnerability? Because I see that the vulnerability details from the researcher says that it depends on ABC. It's, it's, it, it builds off of you know, these other prerequisites. Um, same thing goes with, with threat. If it is an internal embedded device that is running on a, a hardware device that is internal to a, a private network, then you know, I have to basically evaluate what does my threat intel say about um, insider threat? Are there, is, are there viable, realistic, evidence-supported <coughs> threat scenarios that are provided, supported by evidence. And last but not least, you know, impact and then countermeasure. What is the impact of a vulnerability existing? It gets exploited. It's demonstrated by stage levels six in pasta, attack modeling. So proven exploit, it works, but what's the impact? And then what countermeasures do I have to either tighten down my network, my cloud infrastructure, my application through, you know, introducing better code, that I can basically now have a residual risk of understanding. This residual risk makes remediation, countermeasure development to be topical to the most important high impact risks that the application is facing based upon evidence of threats, based upon the inherent impact level, based upon vulnerabilities that have been mapped and proven through exploitation through stage six. At the end of the day, this is what we wanna to get to. We know that when we do security analysis of an application, we identify things that could go wrong in red and things ultimately at the end of threat modeling, <clears throat> the value that developers and engineers get is that they're gonna get prescriptive guidance on what to mitigate that is relevant to, again, the most impactful scenarios. 
if we can prove the viability of attack to developers in stage six and demonstrate the business impact that is inherent in stage one, that affects their technology assets as defined in stage two, then we can basically have a residual risk analysis that says, these are the things prioritized that um, you need to fix. When you're a CISO, and you know, I've been a CISO several times over, one of the things that is hard is to do risk prioritization, knowing what to fix first. And the developers have the same problem. They get a whole litany of things to fix, <clears throat> usually from an output of scanners. They need the guidance. They need the threat analysis. They need the risk prioritization. And that's what really POS is about. So this slide is really, really tiny. But just really quick, we're towards the tail end of the presentation here. Um, this is uh, a racing model for pasta. What it does is it says, hey, let's break down pasta. Who's involved? What are the players? Here are all the stages. Here are the, every, every stage in pasta has activities. And so <clears throat> you have, <coughs> excuse me, you have different roles um, that have a racy responsibility. Racy means responsible, accountable, consulted or informed. So you have management, you have a project management office potentially, you have um, business analysts, you have architecture, you have dev, you have systems engineers, you have QA, you have security analysts in the SOC, you have vulnerability assessors, you have pen testers, you have risk assessors, compliance people, you have software assurance people, and then there's you, security champion, extraordinaire threat modeler. So this is you know a good um, kind of a, uh, representation for what roles should be actually involved in which activities under which stage. Uh, really quick, because I know I only have a couple minutes left. Uh, this is also, you know, if you're trying to see where does this fit into the software development life cycle, depending upon which methodology of, in terms of SDLC you're using, most people out there are using Agile these days, but you can make any of this iterative. Um, this representation here uh, basically says that, you know, for example, under the defined objectives stage, you know, you might have management and business analysts to be really producing things like a, uh, a former risk residual report or a risk profile or a former application assessment that was done on the application to build in that uh, inherent risk. But also importantly is, is that maybe you have security requirements that are really opportune to be defined in stage one. And that's why during a traditional SDLC lifecycle, you put in security requirements during the definition stage, right? Where you're defining requirements. The threat modeling overall, as represented by this diagram, has an opportunity to go further left of the SDLC than just simply um, post deployment. So uh, that's that's a huge opportunity and definitely an opportunity with pasta. Really quick before I uh, fi uh, finish up here, you guys might be thinking, well, you know, this seems like you know, overarching, there's a lot of steps here, there's a lot of activities. You can actually build your own pasta. If you're only ready for one, three, and six, do it, right? And the great thing about pasta is that like in the book, um, if you wanna check out the book um, on off of Wiley's website or Amazon, it actually has mappings to be some, um, open SAM recommendations for software assurance maturity modeling. Definitely uh, follow a crawl, walk, run model create goals in terms of how you want to adopt this methodology over time and also define what sort of activities in each stage of that maturation do you want to uh, operate in. This is just simply an artifact related to um, mapping in BSIM. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in here real quick. But, uh, you know, the idea here is that you have pasta stages. And if you're, if you're familiar with the building security and maturity model, this actually came straight for the book. And building security and maturity model, you have different domains or activities that relates to creating standards, that relates to you know, engaging with architecture, performing security reviews. And that way, if you are interested in embellishing PASTA into your threat modeling process, you can actually map it to a maturity model so you can measure and track how you're doing over time. Um, Oops, sorry. We are here at the very end. Listen, everyone, uh, to all the OWASP global community out there, I really appreciate your time. I appreciate the opportunity to bring to you a introductory level of the PASTA, risk-centric threat modeling. Please follow me on Twitter, T0NYUV, or follow me on LinkedIn. Definitely, if you want to check out the latest uh, depiction of PASTA, 
go to versprite.com, security offerings, AppSec, application threat modeling. Not only does it have all the stages, it also has a lot more detail in kind of a, a summation model that you can operationalize and take it with you. And on top of that, there's an ebook that you can use as well. Thanks so much and great to be here. Thank you very much, uh, Tony, for this presentation. If you have uh, any question, maybe we have one question from uh, someone. Can you speak uh, to some of the tooling that incorporate the pasta? Yeah, so <laughs> in, in, in the past, um, Threat Modeler um, was looking into, um, can, you know, looking to uh, bake in pasta. I know that, uh, you know, my company has looked at Arius Risk to see if we can build our own templates in Arius Risk. Arius Risk is another platform that's out there for threat modeling. Um, but right now, I mean, if you're a threat modeling practitioner, most of the threat modeling tools that are out there, like Arius Risk or Threat Modeler, um, you can actually build and take pasta as a methodology and say, I want to build in, you know, these uh, requirements as part of my threat model process within the tool. Um, so it's it's an, it's it's really meant to be a methodology and uh, really meant to be a process that uh, security professionals follow. So you can build it in any tool, but I think more tools are going to be forthcoming. There is a Python um, threat modeling tool called PYTM. I know some of the uh, members from OWASP, and uh, I know they're actually coming out with their own book. So um, I'll be looking to see if I can take make make some templates that are pasta centric. Okay, thank you very much, uh, and uh, uh, keep uh, connected with our uh, OWASP uh, YouTube channel. Uh, we have another uh, presentation. John will start that. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. Appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.